I have to turn my microphone on before I get yelled at by the wizard's associate. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's not like we haven't seen anybody with all the budget meetings of late, but let's get going here. Routine application. Our league, our Mr. Clerk. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move two routine applications, PD4, Police Department, in the amount of 155272 an additional appropriation for overtime services and PW5 from DPW for 20,000 an additional appropriation for crane truck second items are moved and seconded discussion Mr. Goldrick what are you wrestling with down there <laughs> okay I'm gonna call for the vote I, I think Mr. Hoffman could do both all those in favor aye, aye. opposed Abstaining, eleven zero zero. Um, for those wondering why Mr. Norton is not here, obviously Mr. Norton uh, was leaving for his vacation when the uh, blizzard was coming. So we don't really know exactly when he started his vacation, but we're also he's not back yet, so we miss him tonight. Okay, non-routine applications, ED four. Mr. Pellegrino, Chair of the Budget Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move ED4. This is an approval to use a grant of $11,000 for the Board of Ed. Second. Moved by Mr. Finger, seconded. Uh, moved by Mr. Pellegrino, seconded by Mr. Finger. Discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the Asian Society uh, has awarded Greenwich High School a grant to augment classroom learning for $10,000 and uh, to travel to the 213 National Chinese Language Conference for Teachers, $1,000. Uh, by way of background, Greenwich High School was chosen in 2011 as one of 100 schools in the United States as a Confucius classroom site. It's a recognition of our high school's achievements and leadership in the field of Chinese education. It's an achievement our community should be proud of in that it is a marker in educational excellence. Uh, the Budget Committee uh, voted 4-0 in favor of accepting this grant. Thank you. Further discussion? Question, Mr. Minarski. This has, this is our approval for the appropriation. The RTM has to approve this? Yes. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? I keep writing 12, but it's 1100. Zero, zero. Um, if I may move uh, GM3, this is a request for an additional appropriation of $47,111 for GEMS. Second. Moved and seconded. The uh, committee report. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, the additional appropriation, uh, as stated, is to be used to purchase a temporary trailer to house GEM Station 4. Um, the breakdown of the request is as follows. Um, $39,005 would be to acquire a 12 by 60 three bedroom trailer. $1,400 is for skirting, $2,200 is for stairs, $506 is for pads, and $4,000 is for insulation. That's the, that will total $47,111. As background, Hurricane Sandy forced the displacement of GEM Station Number 4. They moved from Upper King Street to 1165 King Street, which is Greenwich Woods, and subsequently moved to Riversville Road at the Boys Scout Camp, where they are currently located. This appropriation will allow them to relocate at 1327 King Street after the existing structure is demolished, which is the item we will take up next. Um, the Budget Committee voted 4-0 in favor of this additional appropriation for GEMS. Any questions for the discussion? I just want to be very clear. I'm, I'm going to make the BET vote to buy the trailer, and then how could they say no to the demolition? I thought it was an interesting approach. Um, okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? 11-0-0. Mr. Pellegrino, the next item is... Uh, now I wish to move PW4. This is a request for an additional appropriation of $100,000 for Department of Public Works. Second. Moved and seconded. Committee report. Okay. 
Uh, Department of Public Works requests uh, this appropriation. It will come out of our capital non-recurring account to demolish the existing structure at 1327 King Street. Um, of the amount requested, the breakdown is as follows. The demolition of the existing structure and the foundation is $65,000. To create a temporary driveway with access from the golf course to the existing driveway at said site is $15,000. Connections for water and septic, $5,000. Landscaping, $5,000. That totals $90,000 and there is a 10% construction contingency placed on top of that roughly. So the total request is for $100,000. Um, the reason for this request is that the existing structure is in extremely poor condition and require a major rehabilitation to be functional and meet code conditions. It has been the decision of the administration that this would not be money well spent. Uh, the budget committee concurred, 4-0 was our vote. Discussion, Mr. Goldrick. Clarify, if I'm not mistaken, that that building is falling down and a, the, uh, the roof caved in. Right? We're not talking about whether we can enhance the features here. It's it basically needs to be uh, taken down. Sure. Right? If I may respond, uh, the house is in extremely poor condition. It would require major rehabilitation to be functional and to meet code conditions. Um, whether or not I could say that the roof has completely fallen down, I, I haven't been there, but I do know that the problem was that there was substantial uh, water damage leaking through the roof, and that was only one of many, many problems at that site. The, 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 the alternatives, uh, I would say, are virtually zero. Ms. Raymer? Maybe worth adding just two small points. One was that when approval for the uh, trailer was obtained from the Planning and Zoning Commission, there was a condition that uh, the uh, trailer and the house not both reside on the property past November. Uh, so a commitment, if, if you're going to purchase the trailer, something which you've just approved, um, uh, to meet the condition from Planning and Zoning, uh, you're pretty much uh, committed to completing the demolition uh, by November if you're going to re if you're going to meet the condition that was imposed by planning and zoning. Secondly, uh, since Al Manelli is away and not before us tonight, uh, I'd like to repeat an answer that he gave to a question that was important to me at the time. Maybe it'll be important to you too, and that is that in his view, the uh, demolition of the house. Uh, is not a reduction in the value of the land if we were to want to do something else with the property. In his view, it would either be neutral or perhaps even an enhancement to the value of the land to go through the demolition. Uh, and again, that was important to me at the time. I don't know if it's important to you. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Very good. Moving Aye. on. PW6, Mr. Pellegrino. I uh, wish to move PW6. This is a request for an additional appropriation of um, $1,945,000 by the Department of Public Works. Second. Moved and seconded. Committee report. Okay. Um, uh, this, this request is essentially to address um, the expenditures and costs that have resulted from Hurricane Sandy uh, by the Department of Public Works. Um, the biggest categories to describe these costs would be as follows. Number one, $810,000 for waste removal services. Uh, number two, $500,000 for overtime salaries. Number three, $475,000 for various repairs, roadway, building, traffic equipment. And finally, about $80,000 for materials, again, r highways and bridges. Um, the damage, there was damage to 40 town-owned buildings. Uh, that's probably information the public would like to know. And over 4,400 tons of organic debris was handled by the town. Um, the committee voted 4-0 in favor of accepting, uh, approving this additional uh, appropriation. Discussion? I have a couple comments on 
this item and the, the Parks and Rec one I'll, I'll add in later there. Uh, okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? 11 0 0. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to add one footnote to that. And I, should have, I should have said earlier. Of that amount that we're appropriating, we anticipate that we will be reimbursed uh, $1,627,500 or approximately 83.7%. At this point in time, for, for this particular appropriation, we believe the town would be out of pocket, i.e. we would not recover $317,500, just, just for further clarification to the public. Thank you. PW7. Um, PW7, I'd like to move, is an additional appropriation request of $220,000 for the Department of Public Works. Second. Moved and seconded. Can we uh, report? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a request um, that would come out of fund balance uh, to install two emergency generators. Um, one is at North Street Animal Shelter. The other one is at the Holly Hill Transfer Station. In terms of the animal shelter, uh, due to soundproofing requirements of the building, a constant, uninterrupted electrical power supply is needed to provide heating, cooling, and ventilation for the facility. In terms of the Holly Hill Transfer Station, it's essential that the scale is operating at all times. Uh, the committee voted in favor of this 4-0. Discussion? And if I'm not mistaken, um, the generator program, this is in the current year, and then we have other items coming up in the next fiscal year as well. That's correct. Okay, just just be clear. Jim. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Raymer, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, there was an important note that the uh, Commissioner of Public Works had mentioned regarding the Holly Hill uh, generator, and that was um, that um, the ability to be reimbursed by FEMA uh, for the uh, cost of the clearing of debris is a function of having weighed the debris. And if you have um, a Sandy or other similar crisis that has deprived the scale of the ability to be weighing them, uh, you give away that ability to be reimbursed. And so um, probably the generator support for the scale at Holly Hill uh, is potentially a revenue generator and that it's going to create the opportunity for you to be able to demonstrate what was the bulk of the debris that you transported and therefore what's the reimbursement that you're entitled to from FEMA. Ms. Tarkington? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a further comment on uh, your remark. This accelerates the DPW generator program from fiscal 14 to fiscal 13. However, there will be a separate generator issue within the BOE budget for fiscal 14. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? 11 0. PR 5. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, PR 5 it is simply a release of conditions. Uh, I will s specify them in one moment. Uh, just know that the Budget Committee voted 4-0 to move this up to the full board for consideration this evening. Um, the release pertains to $785,810. The conditions were placed on it um, were subject to a release upon receipt and approval by the Board of Estimate and Taxation of respective bids. This is regarding, again, to the Parks and Recreation addressing the damage damages from Hurricane Sandy. Um, that um, there is also a condition that will provide flexibility in prioritizing all projects required for hurricane repair. The committee had a lengthy discussion um, with the commissioner, um, and um, we felt uh, collectively that they had met the requirements of, of, to release this amount so that we can pay these bills that have been incurred. Second. Okay. Discussion? Um, I'll make my comments right now. So we know that the FEMA reimbursement on the Hurricane Sandy items is somewhere in the 70 percent. So, and the town is going to 
not only is it a position where we can accelerate these appropriations, get going on them, get our parks back for the summer season for the residents to use, but it's fiscal stewardship that put us in a position to do that. I mean, this is, for us, this is very easy. We have fund balance. We take this out. The reimbursements, uh, the timeline on the reimbursements, we might not even <coughs> see the reimbursements on these. We certainly won't see them in the current fiscal year. They'll be in the next fiscal year. I, Roll, am I somewhat accurate there? We've already started to get reimbursements. Okay. We got a check for two hundred and twenty-five thousand. We expect another check for two hundred and twenty-five thousand, uh, and we're looking at another eight hundred to a million this year. The piece that's very questionable and hard to determine when it's going to come is the FEMA piece. Right. We're at the, the mercy of the FEMA reimbursement process because of all the people that were right. affected. So uh, we're we're looking at. A piece, but not the major piece of it in the in this current year. But my point is, even today, with the reimbursement, the Hurricane Sandy is still going to leave a a mark on the checkbook. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we're prepared for it. I, I I think that's you know I think that's kudo to you know the things that we've been doing with fund balance and all the other stuff. So it, it's really good. I'm I'm glad from the office of the first selectman through parks, DPW, Board of Ed, that, you know, everybody's on board and we're, we're going after this challenge. So I think that's very important. And I think when, although this release of conditions won't get through the, the RTM, they will see the additional appropriation for the other items. So I think they'll start being able to understand, you know, what we're doing here. With that said, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn my page. Assessor's report. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the BET. Um, I'd like to present the assessor's report for February 2013. So on January 30th, we signed the 2012 grant list. Um, we had roughly an increase of taxable assessment of about 133 million dollars um, on prior to uh, sending out or signing the grand list we sent out change notices to roughly 1600 real estate owners and uh, we sent them to all personal property owners so they, if there's any questions they have the ability to file to the board of assessment appeals by february 20th to date the board of assessment appeals has received about 135 appeals 125 of those are residential and 10 are commercial. Um, tomorrow is the deadline for all filing to the Board of Assessment Appeals. And finally, the RFP for the assessor's admin and tax collector software package is on the street, so to speak. Um, that is going to be due back by March 15th at 3 p.m. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? Thank you very, very much. I, Thank you. Les, Ms. Tarkin? I, I move that we accept the assessor's yes. report. Second. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? 11-0. Sorry, Peter, I'm getting organized here. <laughs> Controller's report? You know, when you go from electronic and then you go back to paper. What? Why? <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, BET members. Uh, we've been pretty busy this month uh, with the, um, the budget process, and I've only got one update to the controller's report. I passed out a document that looks like this. It's an update on the insurance um, submission. Uh, show you how dynamic or how, how quickly this is changing. Uh, I put it in the audit report that uh, we, were, we were up at $6.5 million in request. And in the last week, uh, our risk manager uh, and the internal auditor have got it up to $7.5 million. The piece that you're looking at here is what's going to the insurance companies. And what, what is not accepted by the insurance company uh, will be peeled off. And if it's eligible, it'll go to FEMA uh, through the selectman's office uh, spearheaded by uh, Dustin Anderson. Uh, so we're up to 7.5. Some of these you, you won't see uh, uh, appropriations, and if you can look around the middle of the page, you see a, a number there for $840,000 for trees. 
you won't see uh, anyone coming to you uh, like uh, Joseph Leanne and Tom Greco did when they, a couple months ago, asked you for three million eighty-one thousand. So uh, this is what is being submitted for reimbursement through the insurance process. It's not. It's not the FEMA piece. The FEMA piece will be subsequent to this uh, once the insurance, the adjusters and the insurance people look at it. But uh, if there's any questions there in the controller's report, I'll answer them now. Any questions? I would accept a mic. I'm sorry. Who is that? Oh, Mr. Colbert. Oh, yeah. Mr. Monarski, I think you've got uh, data on home sales here. There, there was an article in Greenwich Time recently that said there was a big upsurge in sales in December, and that was attributable to the uh, fiscal cliff. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, see, over the last seven months in a row, uh, home sales have been either even with or ahead of the previous year's uh, comparable sales year on year. Uh, do I have that correct? And uh, and I think also this comes after. Um, uh, Are we in the controller's report? Yeah. This is in the uh, assessors. Assessor. Oh, the assessors. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Laura, Laura. Sorry, I confused your two reports here. But actually, I was combining the question yeah. because the conveyance tax receipts last time I saw were six months uh, positive year on year uh, for the past six months. Uh, I didn't see it for January, but. January is in the uh, budget committee's package, uh, and I, I think Roland commented uh, last week. Uh, January wasn't as good, but we're we're still about up to about eighty uh, percent out of the uh, four million collected. We're we're over three three million. I guess I just wanted to make a point about uh, what seems to be uh, a. Uh, sustained improvement in our housing market here in Greenwich okay. with the conveyance tax, with the home sales, uh, and uh, it doesn't appear that this was a one-off with the fiscal cliff or, or something like that. Do you, do you want me to summon uh, Lauren to come up and answer the question? And uh, she's the expert in this area. Did you hmm. hear the question, Lauren? Not, not unless you have something to add. That's fine. I just wanted to point that well, out. I okay. I, I will add something. Ms. Tarkington? Yeah, I think that, um, Sean, hopefully you'll also read the revaluation team report because we we analyze um, how many home sales there have been and the valid number of home sales. And actually, whether you're looking at January over January, the last couple of Januaries, it's actually declining. And also um, the same thing with the uh, median rate. So, you know, the market is not as, as strong as some reports initially look. Um, once the data is compared. And I think the other thing is, as you point out, the chart gives some very good information. It's attached to the assessor's report. I would entertain a motion that the controller's report be approved as presented. I would so move. Seconded by Mr. Or moved by Mr. Raymer. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Finger. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you, thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the acceptance of the treasurer's report for January 2013. Make a motion to accept the, approve the um, treasurer's report. I have a motion to accept. Do Second. I? Seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. 1100. BET Standing Committee reports. Uh, I do not have HR checked off. I will call on Mark Johnson for that for right here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the BET HR Committee uh, met today, February 19th, uh, for the purpose of reviewing recommended, recommended increases for MNC and elected official salaries. Um, the committee looked at a number of different data points, um, including market data, CPI data for the metro New York area, um, recommendations and data by uh, Buck Consultants, um, who is currently reviewing the MNC program, uh, programs that we have. We also looked at um, the budget guidelines set by the BET. 
uh, some historic data as well as well as past increases in, for the different positions. The committee, um, uh, when we looked at the MNC employees, we recommended an increase of 2.0 percent for this coming year. Um, that was voted on three to one by the committee. Ms. Kiernan uh, voted against that she was looking for something slightly higher for that level. Um, we also looked at the first selectman and selectman salaries. Um, we recommended a 2.25 percent increase for the first year and a 2.0 percent increase for the second year. The committee voted 4-0 for that amount. And then we looked at the tax collector and the town clerk. Um, a motion was made for an increase of 2.0 percent the first year and 2.0 percent for the second year. Uh, the committee voted 2-2. Two, two. We were deadlocked. Um, myself and Ms. Tarkenton voted for that motion. Uh, Ms. Kiernan and Mr. Hoffman voted against it. Uh, they both were looking at rates lower than the 2 percent. And that is the report. Okay, so let me just save by the bell. <laughs> let me let me just say so those actions on behalf of the HR committee will be moved over to the budget committee for um, consideration the the decision I, I'm not attending the meeting but the decision on the um, where you had that a 2-2 two -two vote I would say I would hand that off to the budget committee for uh, to resolve that uh, on the MCs that number that you're talking about is into the pool of the of the combined salaries for the correct for and the and annual review yes. unless we do a hybrid model or make a change on that so I'm okay there the other two there are, there is a difference in the charter on setting these different salaries one of them I think the BET has the authority just to set the other has to go before the RTM so I would encourage the um, Budget Committee, and the, the, the two chairmen to make sure we're very clear on that on how that goes from there. Are, is the HR Committee having another meeting before we get towards decision day? Um, we will be meeting again on March 7th. Okay. Where we could possibly bring up again the, uh, the tax collector and the town clerk salary adjustments. Okay. I, I think it would be reasonable that we would probably want to have, you know, uh, sort of a report on what the ideas were behind that. I, I mean, I personally would like to have to hear the ideas on both sides of that. So, I, but I appreciate that. Uh, policy procedures, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Brady, uh, on the audit committee report, uh, the last paragraph, uh, and in fact, the last sentence of the report uh, expresses an opinion. Uh, and it's unfortunate that Mr. Norton is not here to take this up, but uh, this was not something that was discussed in the committee, the substance of the last sentence. And uh, I would uh, move that the last sentence be struck from the report. I would second that. So, okay, so let me ask you this question. This wasn't said in that committee meeting at all? Uh, it wasn't discussed, and certainly it was not a committee action. There was discussion in the there was discussion in the uh, committee meeting uh, of the circumstances, I guess, surrounding uh, one or another meetings that had taken place. But the uh, uh, the audit committee itself uh, did not take. I don't believe took this position. So let me ask my question a different way. Were, was this said in the audit committee meeting? In other words, what I'm seeing here is that you have an item that there's, it's still ongoing, and the chairman of the audit committee who's not here, which most likely would mean I would probably wait until he is here because I think that would be more than fair if, it was in, if I wasn't here and I had the yeah. question come up. But I guess my question still would be, did the chair of the committee express those words and that opinion in that meeting? I I don't think so. No, that's a that's fair a, answer, <laughs> Mr. Finger. And we have the, we do have a we do have a, a a literal transcript of the meeting so that we can okay. go back to that. Mr. Finger, 
Mr. Chairman, I, I was not in attendance at that meeting. Um, however, I think the practice of, of the BET, specifically with committee reports, is to express, is to report to the BET what took place from a substantive standpoint at the committee. Um, I know that on um, several committees, or one committee in particular that I serve on where there always is a report, that being the Revaluation Committee, Ms. Tarkington always prepares a, um, a draft of a committee report, reviews it with her fellow committee member, who happens to be myself, and, you know, if there are suggested changes, or modifications, we discuss them if they need to be discussed, and the report reflects the, rep um, the committee's the report is a reflection of the committee, not of the individual. I think what uh, Mr. Brady is expressing here is that this last sentence, certainly on the face of it, appears to be an opinion expressed, whether it was actually expressed at the meeting or whether it's an expression that's just included in this committee report, is that of an individual member of the committee. Um, and I believe that that if one, in, one member of the committee is going to express his or her individual opinion, in this case it happens to be the author of the report, I think the report should then, ha the, the chairman of the committee should give the other members of the committee equal opportunity to express individual opinions, which then I think defeats the purpose of committee reports. So I don't think that this sentence, and again, I was not at the meeting, but I don't think this sentence adds anything to the substance of what the committee was doing. Okay, so. And I'd be, excuse me, sorry, I'd be no. more than happy to suggest that maybe we defer this if Mr. Norton would like to respond, although I think it's the type of motion that probably should or should and can be taken care of even in his absence? I, I would say, as I read that report when it came in, the issues that you're referring to, I was sitting next to you when those, some of those things that were mentioned there did happen. That was factual and that did happen at a committee meeting. My opinion right now is, um, seeking an opinion on that and the accountability for the actions that led to this statement, I chose that it was probably in better interest to the BET not to pursue holding those, I'll use the word, accusations accountable to be proven. I chose not to do that. But in Mr. Norton's defense, I think we, I would postpone the approval or the acceptance, because we don't approve this, we accept um, this until the next meeting when Mr. Norton is here. Um, I'm glad I have your approval, but I will say this. I will say this. Mr. Norton served this town for over 30 years, and something had to be said for him to put that in there that bothered him at a level that he thought was unacceptable, and I think all parties should really really have to explain where that came from. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm choosing not to get into the substance of that sentence. I just, again, want to reiterate that I don't think it – adds anything to what the committee discussed in terms of substantive issues. I mean, every other paragraph in the, in the report is of a factual, substantive nature. And again, this is, and, and I'm not going to debate whether it, no, it's a factual, uh, you know, statement or, I mean, again, it's, I think, one person's opinion. And I don't think committee reports should be reflecting an individual's opinion. I understand. They're entitled to make their statement if they choose to, but I think a committee report that presumes it comes from the committee, and in this case a committee of four individuals, should not reflect the opinion of one individual without the benefit of the others having an equal opportunity. Whether the opinion is a correct opinion or not is, is immaterial. I, I, I understand your point. Mr. Pellegrino. Um, uh, Bill. Um, and Bob, I, I did not have an opportunity to attend that meeting, nor would I have, but um, I just feel very uncomfortable having this discussion without the chairman, Mr. Norton, here. And I know that Bob started his comment along those lines, and I know you were gracious enough to say 
we should postpone this. I'd ask that we table this now and, and do that and kind of sort it out so that we can address this without um, any further discussion. I know as a chairman of a committee, if I were not here and action were taken by the full board without my representation, I would feel very offended, and I do not wish to offend Mr. Norton. Fair enough. With that said, anybody else want to add anything? I'm comfortable with us tabling this. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. Okay, investment law, da, 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 da. BT liaison report. I know we have a revaluation report, and I believe we have. That is it. Any questions on that? Item nine, special project team. Central, we have the MISA building committee report. Ms. Tarkington, I read this report. They're, they're making progress. Where are they right now? Um. MISA has gone out to bid, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, they have held um, two uh, site meetings at the high school for um, potential uh, contractors, um, bidders on, on the uh, subcontracts, and um, they were held last week, last uh, Tuesday and today, and um, bids are now due on March 5th. So more to come on that front. So. Um, Looks good for uh, proceeding with MISA at this point in time. <coughs> Great. Um, I, I'd just also like to add on the soil side of it, um, which is a separate report, that there is a public open house on March 6th. And um, it starts at 6 o'clock um, to 9. There's a um, sort of an open house section. <coughs> There's a panel discussion. There's a period for questions. And again, uh, another open house where you can talk to the various people at, at tables with information. And I urge uh, the members of this board as well as the public to attend on March 6th, and it will be at Central Middle School. Thank you. I'm sure the, the Board of Ed has a press release out on that, the I know. Bo it's a joint press release between the town and the Board of Education, and you're correct. There is a, a press release. Central Middle School, I see they, they must have the auditorium set up for that. Um, why I can indulge on the media who's here. That is um, very important. First public kind of presentation on all of the uh, dealings and the potential deals with the state and the reports are all there. There's so much material in there. There's going to be a challenge getting it loaded up on the web, if I'm not mistaken, when they release all the soil tests and the boring tests and all the other information, it's going to be uh, interesting on how they upload that on the web for public viewing. So, but that's a, that's a positive step towards that. We really haven't, not much from our point of view on Hillside Road's been going on. This will be the first. Right. It's going to it report both the investigative findings and also, you know, a plan for remediation at the site. So good discussion time. Yes, yes. Thank you very, very much. Uh, new business. Uh, approval of the private advisors fund. He got cut off V. Uh, I believe we have liaison report on this, and I believe we have a law committee report on this. So I'm going to start with, let's start with the money side of it first. Mr. Bedrosian, Mr. Goldrick, either, either one of you? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you, would you like us to make the motion first or discuss the, uh, motion, the process? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. So if, if I could move that we approve a retirement board commitment of up to $10 million of capital to the private advisors fund number five. Is there a second? Mr. Goldrick? Second. I, I'll second that. I'll second. Jesus. All right, Mr. Finger second it. Okay. Mr. Bedrosian? Sure. If, if, if I could, I'd be happy to walk uh, the, the board through the process of review for this fund. Um, as the, the board is aware, um, as part of the overall allocation of what is now grown to approximately $336 million of total capital as of uh, January 31st for the retirement fund, a portion of that 
um, with consultation of um, NEPC, the advisor, um, to the pension fund is being sought to be allocated to private equity or other um, direct investment funds with the goal of enhancing the, the return of that portion to complement the overall allocation. Um, over the fall uh, and winter of 2002, we um, had the opportunity to review and be visited by fund managers of numerous funds, um, six or more. Um, one of them uh, was the Harbor Vest Fund that we reviewed and approved at a prior meeting. Um, Pr Private Advisors Fund is yet another one of those funds that has now come through the process. Um, we had a full presentation. Um, of that and uh, just to expand on that um, this is a private equity fund of funds um, the allocation of ten million dollars is analogous to the allocation that was recommended for Harbor Vest all of that fits within the overall private equity allocation that the retirement board has in their in their um, investment uh, goals and allocations this fund complements uh, the Harbor Vest Fund and that this fund is specifically focused on investing in other funds that target small and mid-sized companies. So whereas the Harbor Vest Fund that we had previously committed to invests um, in funds that focus on larger companies and on a more global nature, this is domestic U.S. companies and they're smaller and mid-sized companies, so a complementary um, nature. Um, private advisors um, did participate um, at my request um, on the Investment Advisory Committee via conference call, as did um, Doug Mosley from NEPC, so that, that we not only reviewed the materials that the entire board has, but we also had about 45 plus minutes of an opportunity to ask questions to one of the partners of um, private advisors to, to walk through various um, questions. Um, some highlights um, in addition to the fund strategy that are worth mentioning briefly. Um, the fund has been in business for 15 plus years. Um, it is now uh, majority owned by uh, New York Life, the big insurance group. The remaining portion is owned by the partners and employees of the fund. It is SEC registered and it is a U.S. Um, partnership, which the law committee will address. Um, this is the fifth fund um, with this strategy. They've been investing in this strategy for many, many years and have had um, very successful um, returns to date. The target returns for this fund net of all fees to the retirement board is approximately 20 percent, which is again a strong complement to the investment strategy of the balance of the portfolio. And again, because it is a diversified fund of funds, the, the specific risk that the retirement board would be taking on any specific investment is mitigated through that, um, through that diversification. We, after the, the question and answer and discussion of the material, the Investment Advisory Committee voted 4-0 in favor of recommending um, this to the full BET. Thank you. Wow. Interesting. Um, Mr. Raymer, Law Committee. And the Law Committee considered this. Uh, our, um, our perspective is perhaps a little different than the Investment Advisory Committee, uh, but with the assistance of very capable Jean McLaughlin, um, who's not with us tonight, um, uh, we um, uh, reviewed with him his observations regarding the documentation. It would be fair to observe that the documents came to us on a, short, on a somewhat short fuse, so that the ability of the committee members, both Leslie Tarkington and, and myself, to review the underlying documentation in any detail was very truncated. Uh, but we certainly were comfortable that uh, Attorney McLaughlin had reviewed these in some uh, detail. We asked a, uh, a number of uh, pointed questions to which he responded to our satisfaction. At the end of this process, um, we voted 2-0. Uh, I'll read perhaps the resolution because I think that should be part of the record. The resolution that we approve read as follows. Upon a motion duly made and seconded, the Law Committee of the Board of Estimate and Taxation, members Tarkington and Raymer present, voted 2-0 to find that the Law Department has reviewed the relevant legal documents, including the limited partnership agreement, the private placement memorandum, the letter from NEPC and the side letter with private investors fund. The law committee finds that the documents are in legal order for the agreement by the retirement board to invest as a limited partner in the private advisors small company buyout fund five in an amount not to exceed $10 million. And again, that resolution was approved by a vote of 2-0 by the two members of the law committee. Okay, so I have an item that's been moved, been seconded. 
Further discussion? Mr. Raymer. Uh, the following remarks are in no way the opinion or decision of the law committee. The law committee acted as I had just described. I apologize to my brethren to uh, suffer me repeating comments that I have made uh, at least twice, actually three times before, but I, want, I wish once again to make the following observation <clears throat> as the rationale by which uh, I intend to vote against this particular investment. Uh, I, uh, I willingly point out to my colleagues that on the prior occasions when I also voted against them, I was a, a minority of one uh, voting against them. Uh, I also want to say in passing uh, that this is not intended as a reflection upon the extremely capable assistance that we get from people like John Chadwick uh, and Larry Simon. It's also not intended to be a reflection of the uh, high regard that I hold uh, the uh, wisdom and professional viewpoints of very fine people who bring their talents to us, such as Greg Bedrosian and um, uh, Art Norton uh, and uh, Joe Pellegrino and others. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I view carefully um, the um, somewhat garbled section that appears as Section 208 of our charter. Uh, 208 seems to vest in an independent retirement board custody and responsibility for the funds, but then asks that the BET act and approve when we are passing uh, either agreements or selection of people to run money for us. Those should have the um, decision of the BET uh, in addition to that of the retirement board. It's not very clear for me what role I'm supposed to take, but it did seem to me that when, in my judgment, we had leaned too heavily to alternative forms of investment as a way to try and supplement uh, risk and reward, supplement uh, the, um, uh, the profitability of our portfolio, that if I find myself uncomfortable with the percentage of our funds that are invested in these alternative investments, then that's a matter which um, I'm supposed to clear my voice and vote uh, in opposition if that's what seems to me. I don't enjoy the sophistication as an investor of some of the people that, whose names I've mentioned in these comments, and without my diminishing in any way my high regard for them, I will vote against this only because I feel that we are too heavily committed to alternative investments, and I would rather not do so. Thank you. Anything? Any comments? Okay. Um, so we have a resolution moved, second discussion. Uh, I would say all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? One lonely voice, Mr. Chair. Abstaining. So it's going to be 10 1 0. No. Okay. Under new business, I wasn't in possession when I built the agenda, so I'm going to ask for just a slight bit of leniency, and I'm going to lean on Mr. Brady and Mr. Geiger to help me a little bit. In front of you, you all have an opinion out of the law department. I'll see if I can give you the how this came to be. Mr. Brady and I were on CIP committee, and I guess one day talking about some of the sewer projects in the, in, in the current appropriations and in the future, we had a question. So we were asking Roland. I actually, Roland and I were trying to figure out how to ease these projects because the sewer maintenance fund is basically done pay-as-you-go. The sewer improvement fund is a little bit more complicated. The, the sewer districts pick it up the, and part of the, the debt is spread out over the whole town. So Roland made an appointment with Gene uh, McLaughlin in the law department to go talk about this. So I said, I'd like to attend. And I said, Mr. And Mr. Brady, I think, jumped in too. And we went down there and Roland basically had asked Gene some questions. This is the opinion that comes back. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complex than I think, but I, I, I'm doing this, and I think this is important because the Budget Committee obviously working on capital tomorrow. Matter of fact, you don't even have to go home tonight. You could just set the room up and start tonight. Um, but my point is we do, again, in normal fashion, we've, we have some challenges. We have alternatives. You'll never find the alternatives unless you really dig in and look. So I, I would give ask everybody for a, maybe a, an overnight read on this, because I know you just got it now. 
But basically, there are certain sewer projects that we could move from maintenance to improvement. And therefore, obviously, the financing model is different. Uh, it's spread out over a, a larger group of property owners, and there's some other benefits. Um, I know Mr. Brady, I'm, I'm going to call on him in a minute. I'm sure Mr. Huffman, you know, some of the people have been in the RTM for a long time. I've heard these discussions over the years. I just think it's, it's hitting now. So with that, an open discussion. Mr. Brady, if you want. Uh, I don't have too much to say on this, I, except that to the extent that it allows us to uh, levelize the, uh, the financing over a longer period of time uh, for what are long-lived assets, uh, regardless of what we call them, whether it's repair or maintenance, uh, the work does last a long time. Um, I think we are wise to avail ourselves of such capability when it's available to us on a reasonable basis. Mr. Huffman? Um, and I think uh, you have come up with ideas that do need to be looked at, as have others, with regard to how under our charter and with changes that we might make as to the structuring overall of the uh, entire uh, sewer system and its treatment and such. And I, I note that right in the opinion that we got at the bottom of, I guess, the second page of it, it's noted, and I would certainly concur, that uh, as we go forward with these discussions, the bond council firm that the town uses should be brought into this process because they will certainly have expertise and a role in this. Uh, let me add to an example. If I, I hate, I'm sorry, Roland, to put you on the spot, but the sewer maintenance fund, how much is in that fund? In terms of resources. Not much. Not much. So if we were to do a, a project right now out of sewer maintenance, <coughs> it would be PAYGO, right? Yes. And PAYGO would be done by the in your sewer tax not your not your your general fund mill rate but your sewer tax yes okay so if we were to do let's pick a project and tell me how we fund it just take us down that that road we're going to do a, we get a five million dollar project we would tax for a million dollars a year over the next five years for the affected sewer district or for everybody in the district in the district for everyone in the district okay if we were to do that same project in improvement how would we do it okay and who would pay that bond so theoretically if you're in the sewer district you're paying 75% and if you're not, you're paying 25%. So obviously, going to Mr. Brady's point, obviously that the payments would be lower on an annual basis, but it would also give you the ability to increase the payees, the amount of property owners that are paying into it. So the other thing that uh, would happen if you move, this uh, sewer maintenance has a significant capital plan in the budget right now the next projects out of there, I would basically move them out of page as you go and bond them, you impacting what would be the uh, that's uh, Correct. But it, it wouldn't matter because, well, it would matter. It would, yeah. That would have an impact. But, that, that, but by the same token, if these projects run into, what's the word I'm looking for, challenges, we're, we're then not taxing, you know, and not getting the project either. Uh, my, my favorite Donald Landsman argument of, of the old days. I, there's probably some type of balance here. The BET, according to, this, according to this, would have to determine the portion and what each project is, correct? I mean, if you read Gene's opinion. So that, that if I'm going to pick on Roland, I should pick on Peter. What, what does this mean to us? If this is something we would like to see a model, an example, possibly, again, look into this. How do we do, what would we do next? We could easily just tell Joe Pellegrino to tell us, tell us what to do and give him the headache. But I, I'm just looking, how would we do this? What would we do? Would we pick a project and 
Because we the BET has to make some decisions on this. On the, well, on the first step is, is does it belong in the sewer maintenance or does it belong in the sewer improvement? Correct. And if we if we uh, change the definitions or the way we've been defining them and you shift it to the sewer improvement, there's, there's no change. It just it goes over and you do the, the bands, the bands, the 20 years. It does increase the, uh, the hit against the debt sir, uh, right. the debt ceiling. But then again, it would reduce your your capital quote capital tax levy. And I think uh, and I don't know the impact of it because this is one of uh, Leslie brings us up every year the spike in the uh, mill rate in the sewer M and the uh, sewer I the maintenance and improvement. You'd be smoothing it uh, with the uh, sewer maintenance because you're finding over 20 years. Yeah, right now, we're looking at the over 11 percent new rate increase in the sewer maintenance. <coughs> where the budget looks right now for 13, 14. Uh, go, go ahead. I'm, I'm all ears. I was just going to say, on a, on a combined basis, looking at both funds as they're now presented, uh, the increase to the 75 percent plus of the taxpayers that are within the sewer district is an increase of 4.71 percent. Last year, that increase was 17 percent, and anyone who lived in the sewer district, their taxes didn't go up 2.75 percent their taxes went up 3.45 percent. So any solutions that we can find that make sense and also whose depreciable life would be at or exceeds 22 years because linking bonding to the depreciable life of the assets also is makes sense, um, I think is terrific. I want to thank you and Mr. Brady for working on this. And um, we need to address how we're going to handle these, you know, tremendous obligations that we see coming on to the sewer district. So this is great work. Mr. Brady, I'm sorry, Mr. Finger was first, actually. But please correct me if I'm wrong. If we're, if we're moving a cost from, from sewer maintenance to sewer improvement, aren't we then, in a sense, encumbering the non-sewer district residents with with a cost that they currently would not have. That, as Roland just said, uh, it would be 50-50, 50% general fund, 50% sewer fund. Whereas now it's 100% sewer fund and 0% general Peter, fund. You're going to need, Peter, you need a microphone. You need a microphone. Just grab a microphone. Because, thank you, I'm sorry. Say that again. What what I think Bill's trying to say is, th th when we sat with Gene, Gene used the word reconstruction. If you're reconstructing something, that would certainly qualify, being able to do that. And yes, your point is that instead of a percentage of the town picking up the cost on a f on pay as you go, it would be more likely the whole town picking up the cost on a longer term note. There's some impacts. It is a policy decision on our point, you know, on a, from, from our point. But it's it certainly, and I give Ms. Turkington, I, I don't know how you remember those numbers like that, but that's okay. <laughs> but I, my point is, the truth of the matter is, I mean, we've heard Ms. Turkington say that for a long time, and we're seeing that. I don't know what other communities do. I, I know what... It, it's not quite as easy, and that's why I say I, I wish we all had another day or so to look at this opinion to make, make our choices, but it is certainly something we should look at. So, Mr. Brady was next. I was uh, hoping I would, or wondering when I would get a chance to use this line, uh, that I have probably spent more time down in the Greenwich sewers than the rest of this board combined. Your, your personal life is... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, S.E. Minor. Uh, one of the things, uh, there are two aspects. There's the financial side, where we have this uh, accounting difference treatment between maintenance and improvements. Uh, and then there is the, uh, we call it practically the engineering side, where we are uh, maintaining pipes, pumps, uh, connections, manholes, uh, the, all the way down to the sewer treatment plant. Um, and Amy, I'm sure, could explain it much more uh, with, with great, great, much greater panache. Uh, but it is a system as a whole, uh, and it benefits the town as a whole. Having a, having a reliable, well-maintained sewer system 
protects the harbors. Uh, it protects downtown Greenwich, as I recall. We had some flooding down there a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a, certainly a benefit to those of us who live in the denser, more densely populated parts of town, uh, not to have to maintain our own septic systems or hope our neighbor maintains his. Um, but it is a community asset. And to the extent that the, what I would consider a somewhat artificial accounting difference between maintenance and improvements uh, is challenged, amended, changed out of a, as, a, as a matter of policy, uh, we may well benefit the town through better maintenance, more timely uh, work being done, uh, as well as spreading the costs over the life of the asset, which this would give us the opportunity to do. Mr. Pellegrino. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to say anything because I'm just looking at this for the first time. But I'm struck by two things. One is um, you have tasked um, Mr. Johnson, myself, Mr. Brady, and Mr. Huffman with looking at our financing model. And so I would first and foremost say we'll take this into consideration as we go into those discussions, which will probably be next month. Um, and we will need to look at models to understand math just in black and white numerically what what this is about. But the second thing I'm struck by is a, is a concept of uh, equity and fairness. And um, I have no reaction to this right now, but I'm, I'm concerned about those members of the community that are not in the sewer district are bearing the cost 100% of their septic system, whether they fail or have to put in a new one or repair them or maintain them. They're bearing those costs. And so now if we're talking about changing how we're going to consider sewer projects so that the f historical dis change, the historical way of looking at maintenance versus the other alternative were to shift um, some of that burden onto those people that are outside of the district. I, I just think we as a board need to think very long and hard about that along the lines of what's equitable and what's fair. Um, a, a person who's not in the sewer district does not have the option to put his or her cost back to all the other uh, town uh, citizens for them maintaining uh, the proper disposal of waste. And I'll just leave it at that. I think there's some issues here that really need to be thought out and thought carefully about. I, I agree. There, there's definitely two sides to this. And But let, let me just say this. We've, I'm sorry, Mr. Hoffman? Let me just make a point that I was planning to before uh, Joe spoke. We, we need to recognize that even though there are people with their residence properties outside of the school district, outside of the sewer district. Nonetheless, a lot of what is in the sewer district are public facilities, schools, this building, many others. They serve everyone and they are a benefit to the entire town. And those should not be borne just by those people who are in the sewer district, those costs. I just like to point out that the public buildings pay a sewer tax. So everybody is paying for that out of the general fund. Ms. Targington? Uh, yes, I'd, just, I'd also like to add that a lot of the work that we are going to be doing are legal settlements on the Clean Water Act with the EPA. And with our other law settlements, and I serve on the law committee with Mr. Raymer, the costs of those settlements are spread throughout the town and on, on all taxpayers. With these settlements, it, the burden of those legal settlements are being restricted to only those properties within the sewer district. So I think that there are many, many conversations that we can have on this and should have on this, but I think there are issues like this that we need to put in perspective. Um, and also, I think that's sufficient. Thank you. Mr. Brady, the next time I open up a can of worms, We'll do it again because th these are conversations that need to happen. There, there's valid points on, on, on all sides of this, but I, I think it's we just 
we're, one of the things that challenged me in, this, in the sewer projects is they're the type of projects that they're hard to get them going. They're, they're, they're intensive. Uh, they're done in, in series of, of segments. So I, I think that it's, it's important. But I, I do think this is, I think this is actually really good BET work. This is the work I think we should do. We may change nothing, but it, it, to have alternatives or to have, a, you know, it's just I think that's, that's important to us. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, old business, old business. BET calendar. Everybody should have the latest, greatest. What is this one called? BET everything. This is how I get this in the email from Elaine. Uh, we're trying to keep that up. Um, again, moving meetings, meeting rooms. Uh, our meeting, um, I'll bring it up on our chairman's report, what, what we had to do there and some room for improvements there but I just want to make sure everybody has their current schedule item 12 approval BET minutes for January 23rd 2013 move moved I'll by Ms. Karen second second, second. by Ms. Tarkington any discussion all those in favor uh, opposed abstaining there we go 11-0 um, Madam Secretary do you have anything this month Chairman's report. Um, obviously, you'll get an, a, a, a meeting call for um, next Tuesday. Uh, that'll be going out. Um, the um, there's been a lot of uh, what it, what it takes to get a meeting room has just had a hit, has hit an epic level. I will tell you, I I put in hours trying to get a meeting room. I am I am just telling you, it's been a challenge to get meeting rooms, to move meeting rooms. it. Mr. Brady helped me. Uh, there's an antiquated system. I, uh, That's the frustration. Frustration. I cannot even begin to tell you what, I, what I've done. Um, I will be asking Mr. Raymer, who helps me a little bit with uh, parliamentary and procedure stuff, for a meeting coming up about our, our main BET budget approval meeting on how we will go through the items that night. Um, which is really important because that's really how Roland's going to print it up for us. Whether we're going to go by department, major object code, department, major object code, EOCs, or how we're going to do that. Um, obviously, so I will be asking Mr. Uh, Raymer for a little bit of help there. The budget process is moving. Obviously, everybody's, we've had some really good attendance by the BET. Um, the RTM members are less than 10. I wish we had a little more participation. Uh, tomorrow's capital and next week rolls into the meetings I, I want to just uh, my sincere thanks Roland Peter uh, budget committee members and everybody's attending I think I think we're doing it, it's a difficult year there's there's challenges out there and I think we're working through it I think tomorrow's capital and fixed charges presentation will be interesting uh, Peter has sent out the slideshow for revenue fixed charges there's one other one you sent, I believe, and gives us a chance. It's only two. It gives us a chance to, you know, see where, see the trends there, so we we have an idea. And um, other than that, I uh, I have nothing else. Mr. Goldrick. Seconded by Mr. Brady. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>